now it's my pleasure to welcome four of the Muslima ambassadors, um, Uzma Ahmed Anderson, Susu Attar, Bailili Lidasan, and Dalia Merzaban. And um, introducing the panel will be Hannah Barber. Um, I want to say a little bit about Hannah, our moderator. She is a Bay Area radio personality. Um, we're honored that she's also one of the Muslima ambassadors for this project. She's a reporter and co-host of Cross Currents, a daily radio news magazine that broadcasts on KALW Public Radio in San Francisco. And her interviews and reporting range in topics from ethnic community issues to poverty and health issues, um, spanning across to culture, religion, politics, and the arts, a truly comprehensive subject matter. On a national level, she also does freelance writing and radio work and has appeared on various NPR programs and PRIs the world. She's a Sudanese American and reports from and about Sudan and Sudanese communities. She's currently also the secretary of the Sudanese Association of Northern California. So please join me in welcoming Hannah and our four ambassadors. Thank you, Claire. So it's wonderful to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, so part of the Muslima exhibit included all the ambassadors coming up with an answer to a question. And that question was, how do you define yourself as a Muslim woman today? And we all, you know, it was, it was part of the deal. We all had to kind of write down our stories. But there was something interesting that the story had to be six words long. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so it was indeed, it was a challenge um, for, for myself uh, and I'm sure for many others. But we did manage to kind of. Um, not condense our lives into six words, but find that profound experience or kind of the core of who we are now and turn it into uh, a six word story. And they're called Muslima stories. If you go to the exhibit at imow.muslima.org. And so mine, that's mine. And uh, I thought and thought, and I had many in my head, and my Muslim sisters kind of helped me out, and we brainstormed, and they liked this one the most, I think. Uh, cancer didn't kill the radio star. And um, it's a play on words. If you remember the 80s, there was a song that came out when MTV first came out called Video Killed the Radio Star. And, and my personal experience with this disease twice um, has made it a profound part of who I am and what I am uh, and um, what I do today. And so we ask the same uh, of all our ambassadors. So we are going to introduce them. And here they are. Uh, first here next to me is uh, Uzma Ahmed Anderson. She's our, our ambassador from Denmark. So Uzma is a thought leader and curator working with art as a process that can create space for reflection that leads to change. And she does community building within low-income neighborhoods in Copenhagen. She calls them ghettos. She says that is what they call them there. So um, Uzma, tell us a little bit about yourself and your six-word story is showing behind you, by the way. Well, when I wrote it, um, I was thinking about the opportunity that I have to work with people and collaborate with them. So I was thinking that I hope that I could keep my curiosity and learn from the people I work with again and again. And that's what I was thinking. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, next is Dalia, Dalia Merzaban. She is an Egyptian Canadian living in Dubai. She's a journalist and financial news editor who specializes in the Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey. I think you work now with Bloomberg? Right. In her spare time, she writes on her blog and for the Huffington Post about Islamic spirituality 
in modern life and kind of how to fit Islam into a busy schedule. So Dalia, you have your six word story up there. Tell us more about you. Sure, um, I'm a writer, so professionally I write about finance and economics in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, uh, and uh, I'm also a creative writer. Uh, I, love, I love expressing myself uh, on my blog um, creatively, and I write about how I fit uh, Islam into a very, very modern professional life. Um, it wasn't always the case, like for a lot of my life, I, I, I believe that you know, being a high-powered journalist and uh, being a spiritual person were at odds with one another. Um, and uh, as I've embraced Islam in the past few years, I re realized that I was wrong and that the, the two sides of my personality actually come together very beautifully. Um, and so that's why I'm here today, hopefully to share a little bit about that. All right, thank you, Dahlia. All right, next is Bailali Lidasan, and she's our representative from the Philippines. Bailali is an executive director of a research and advocacy institute that works closely with women and children in grassroot communities. She is a former United Nations volunteer reproductive health advocate. Her commitment to women empowerment comes from her passion to help Muslim Filipino women realize their potential as leaders of social change without losing their connection to their cultural identity. Bye, Lali. Well, first of all, I'm a nurse. Uh, I, my work before was a reproductive health advocate, so I'm a mother of two boys. So all my work revolves around the thought that I have to do something now for my children so that they could live in a better place for as Muslims and as members of the community of the entire world. So my story is rich wisdom of the younger I wish. So it, it's my I, as my as a mother, I wanted to sh to leave something for my children, um, something that the knowledge that I have done something now for my generation to affect change. So I, it's my wish that the younger generation would take, would analyze and learn from the history of the elder of the el of their elders, and learns and move forward two steps forward to affect change and become a better person. Um, as part of the world and of their community. Ah, by Lali, thank you. Last but not least, Susu Attar is an Iraqi-American multimedia artist. She is also uh, she also works with Golden Thread Productions, a theater company in San Francisco. Susu. Hi. Um, I this is my story and. Um, so the word third space, for those of you who don't know, comes from post-colonial theorist Homi Baba. And um, the, yeah, uh, so there's, he coined the term third space as a concept of a free space that isn't stuck between the binary of here and there, east and west, however you want to look at it, black and white. Um, so I think for me, uh, it really resonates because I believe in existing in the complexity as I exist and not in the labels that we tend to put on ourselves and I, I feel like art and creativity really um, really lives in that third space it is the third space deep <laughs> thank you Susu <laughs> thank you Susu and uh, so let's let's kind of warm up with the basic question like why why uh, why are you a part of this exhibit what drew you to it who would like to take that one on? Dahlia. Oh, sure. yeah, let's start with Dahlia then. Yeah. Um, well, I just think that when I heard about the exhibition, it, it really coincided with what I, I like to do in my personal writing, which is try to address and break down stereotypes um, about Islam and about Muslim women. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the spirit of Islam gets lost in the global dialogue. Um, so that's why I decided to take part, and uh, it's been a very fulfilling experience. So, so you had your hand up? Yeah. Um, I actually was kind of pressured into applying. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody that I know was like, you're in San Francisco, you're a Muslim woman, and you're an artist. If you don't apply to this, you're lame. So <laughs> eventually, um, I did apply to it. Um, and. 
as my Muslim ambassadors know already, I, uh, upon meeting them, such a great group of women, so uh, powerful in the work and perspectives that they bring to just one room, that that was enough to keep me involved. And it just got better after. Mm -hmm. Bye, Well. Um, I take this I take this project as an opportunity for the world to know the Muslim women in the Philippines because um, the Muslims in the Philippines are more of a minority. So we're about thirty to twenty percent, twenty to thirty percent Muslims in the southern part of the Philippines. Um, so it, it, it's it's I, I took it upon myself that um, I would like to I, I would like other people to know that the Muslims in the Philippines are not the the kind of the, uh, the the perception that they have in their mind that we are, yeah, just what like Samina said, are a, a Arab of Arab origin or descent, but we are we are Southeast Asian. This are this is a Southeast Asian Muslims, so I, I would like to the world to see us, the Philippines. These are the Muslim Filipinos, Muslim women in Southeast Asia. All right, and Usma. Well, I was very skeptical. I was thinking that why take on that dress of being a Muslim? And because I come from Denmark, and it has a different context. Um, if you if you say that it's more strategic to say that I'm a woman than say I'm a Muslim, because you already labeled when you say the name Muslim. So we were discussing it in the group, but but really we felt that. Maybe we have to become more activistic, and maybe we have to set the agenda and step forward to do so. And I, I thought, well, this is a, the opportunity, so we did it. Two skeptics <laughs> who've turned to the dark side after that. So let's let's talk about your work. Um, to what extent uh, is your work, your art, your community building? inspired by your faith, by being a Muslim, by Islam. Dahlia is so ready, no? <laughs> yeah, I don't mind, it's okay. I mean, I, obviously my personal writing is, is inspired by my faith because I write about faith. Um, but I think it's a lot more than that for me because um, Islam is actually a way of life. It's, it's, um, it's something that weaves together my days and brings me peace of mind and tranquility. Uh, it makes me compassionate, and um, it makes it gives me uh, purpose, and um, and you know it, I apply qualities of integrity, etc., to all of my daily interactions. So I can't really separate Islam from anything because it actually is um, it's such an, an integral part of my existence that um, the way that I interact with people in the office and the way that I interact with my friends, um, and it, it's just it's part of who I am, so uh, I can't separate it. Um, so it is, it is the greatest inspiration in my life, um, and, and that's something that I carry into my very hectic, busy newsroom, where I take you know, time to pray, even if I'm working 12 hours a day, and, um, and I, I usually work 12 hours a day. Um, and it's, it's um, something that I carry into all of my, uh, my daily interactions. So, yeah. Osma, you wanted to answer it? Well, I don't talk much about being a Muslim. I am a Muslim, and that's, uh, that fills the whole picture. But uh, the way I work with people, the way I interact with people, especially because it's in Denmark, and we are told to make integration programs, and that's, I'm a project leader there in the so-called ghetto. And it would be easy to be a professional who's talking to people and telling them how to do. This is the way you can become a daily citizen. This is the way you can become right. But uh, instead, I, I think I find humbleness and I find the, the, the language, because I, we don't need to speak the same language, but if we communicate out of love and out of the heart and because we, we really don't have a goal that says that we need to please the government, but we need to find out how can we, we uh, interact and create society. And I think the way, well, I think my belief makes things happen and makes me interconnect with people. 
um, so that they can see who I am and my intentions and well that builds trust and that creates the space for pushing in new knowledge and pushing in creativity, pushing in reflection so that people are willing to grab what you have and maybe develop and create a new way of seeing things, a new reality. Mm. But Laili, how does, how does your faith inspire your work? Before I was called a Muslim ambassador when I joined the project, uh, it, it was imperative for me um, in my everyday, I mean, my day-to-day -day, um, dealings with people in my work to always bring out the best of me. Um, not only as a Muslim, but as a person. So I do not look at all my religion as something that that gives me a difference from other uh, from other faith or from other people, but it gives me something to hold on, to really, to really, um, what's the word? To really struggle, to really strive, to be, to 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 go to to go to the direction of being a good person and nothing else. So that when people, sometimes in my, in my country, I have I have non-Muslim friends, and when in, when first time we meet, they would that they would they didn't have any idea that I'm, I I am a Muslim because I don't wear veil and everything. And I, I wanted that way because I want them to know me as a person first than as a Muslim. Because when I would introduce myself, oh, I'm a Muslim, sometimes people will have this biases and prejudices and they would immediately put a wall and that would take the opportunity for me to know them better and them to know me uh, as a person. Okay, uh, and I just want to remember everybody that you can be writing down any questions that you are in, now inspired to ask uh, and send them to the ushers with the lovely question mark signs behind you over there. Um, so I want to get into this this idea of, of feminism and Muslim feminism. There are, you know, the Muslim world is full of Muslim feminists who are working, um, you know, to empower women there. and kind of this notion that there, there is no one monolithic form of feminism. And that feminism that may have been born in the 1970s here in the US might not work for other parts of the world um, with different backgrounds and different religions. Do you guys think there is such thing as a Muslim feminism or a Muslim feminist? Or do you think that's an oxymoron or what are your feelings about that? Hmm, <laughs> Uzma. Well, there's feminism, and it's defined in many ways. And I don't know about the context here, but in Denmark, um, the feminists, they often want to save women like me by telling me how can I be a liberated woman. And I could say that I don't want to be a feminist, and I don't want to be part of that agenda, but well, I'm an activist, so I've jumped into it, and I say that I'm a feminist. I'm fighting for the right to define myself and define how I am a woman. And um, I think it's it's a bit of a battle still, but uh, I, I claim that I'm a feminist, and I don't see a contradiction to being a feminist or and being a Muslim. Because you've created your own definition of what that is. Yeah, and I think it's... it's uh, it's getting space, and I, I see that a lot of feminists can see the idea. And, and They're getting it? it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I, I don't actually identify myself as a feminist uh, generally. Um, louder, okay. Um, I, uh, for me, I think it's kind of important to understand what Islam is. Um, uh, a Muslim is, in Arabic, means one who devotes herself or himself to God. And, um, you know, I, I spent most of my life uh, not really practicing Islam. Uh, and it was only a few years ago that I, I have what I call a spiritual awakening, uh, mm -hmm. where I had like a moment of clarity and, and um, I was inspired um, to embrace my faith. And um, it's what happened in the process, it actually happened uh, quite remarkably right before my father passed away. And um, I, was, I felt very blessed to have been inspired by God, um, and I, I felt very grateful to him. And so I started to try to you know, um, find ways to 
capture and to um, honor that relationship. And I started to pray, for instance, and I love praying. I wake up before uh, the early morning prayer before sunrise and, and I pray extra prayers every day. And I fast every week because I feel like it purifies me. Um, and I, um, I give charity very generously, a lot more than I used to, and that's because um, I feel like all of the possessions that I have are not really mine. They belong to something greater and that I should distribute them. So um, I d developed a lot of qualities, you know, I've, it, it's taught me patience. The more I embrace Islam, the more I become patient, the more I become uh, empowered, the more I find peace. And so I guess, you know, if that's what empowerment is, if, that what, if that's what feminism means, then that's fine. But for me, all I really need to say is that I'm a Muslim because, because it really does give me the greatest freedom. And I think that a lot of women feel the same way. It's sometimes hard to articulate it. Mm -hmm. so, so? Um, so I kind of find the word feminist to be redundant. I mean, I'm, I'm a woman, so of course I care about my right to be a freely a woman. I'm not even sure what, how to take that word sometimes. Outside of the, the fact that it does manifest differently in different places, there's Western feminism, there's Muslim feminism, there's all these feminisms, but I feel like if you agree that women are human beings and that they deserve to be treated as such, then there's no need to call myself anything to describe that, it's, that should be the fact. I mean, it's, it's kind of upsetting that you have to even say that you're for women's rights, it's weird, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, um, yeah. But, but do you I feel do enough think, people feel that way as well? I think, I mean, I, I think there's a difference between what I experience and what I hear being told as a story. I think I experience that to be true of most people that I encounter in my travels and in the States, I don't think that's the dominant narrative. I don't think that's how we talk about women or how women are written into history, for sure. But I do think that there are Muslim women feminists, and I think some of them would argue that Islam is feminist. It, it, it came with the intention of giving women rights in a time and location where they didn't have many. Alayla, would you like to? I cannot, really, I cannot really say I'm a feminist. I don't even um, use that word um, to apply to myself. But um, I, I think every woman, not only Muslims, but every woman has this, I believe that they have these rights um, that should always be respected, especially their dignity, their, their life, their, um, their ideas. Um, as long as women, uh, as long as a man, women, everybody, Look at women as equal. Um, I don't think feminism would would be a, re a redundant thing but because we should always have this inside us that looking at people, look at looking regardless of race, religion, or, or anything, we should always look at them as, as a fellow human being. So their rights, their their dignity should always be respected. Human first, then woman. Um, okay, so S Samina earlier, you heard her talk about, um, she touched on the next question that I want to ask you, and I think many Muslim women that I know feel like they're kind of having this, this, this battle on two fronts. On the one hand, trying to you know, the, break the stereotypes in the media, um, in the commercial media, not public media. <laughs> public media. <laughs> a little shout out, a little bit. Um, but kind of trying to face that and confront that outside image of you, of us, but at the same time, there's a battle going on inside as well, within the Muslim communities as well. And as women, I think we can feel that sometimes as soon as we go to the mosque. You know, um, uh, whether we're given the tiny space to pray in, whether our communities are, you know, patriarchal, whether, you know, so there, I think there, like, we have, it, we have a double kind of war to, well, not war, but just a battle that we're kind of waging uh, and facing. How do, you, how do you feel about that? Like, do you, do you think 
or what's worse, the one from the outside or the one going on uh, on the inside? Because there is an idea also that we need to fix the community from within first and then go outwards by lady. I think the, the most difficult um, struggle or challenges every oh sorry every the, the most difficult challenges every uh, Muslim should take upon themselves is this is struggle to uh, the, the, what we call the higher jihad or it's, it's a struggle against yourself against your pride not against other people um, it's as long uh, uh, if you have this if you fight to get rid of your pride, to become a better person. That's the better jihad. So you should always start from yourself. And then when people will be able to look at you and see that you have changed, then they would also change. And um, in, in my kind of, in, in our, in my work in the Philippines, um, we, have, we have this pro project um, that we group together students, um, um, the Muslims and the non-Christians, but uh, one thing that is very successful in in, in in these projects are the group of the Muslim Muslim youth, because um, in that way we, we have this intra dialogue, which is very very important. So that um, there would be uh, they would understand among themselves the Muslim the Muslim youth uh, what Islam is re uh, re is really all about. It's not the thing that is imposed on them. Um, told by their parents, the, the, the thing that they see from the commercial media, you call it. But it is how they really feel and how they really understand Islam. And in what's liberating in that uh, intra-dialogue um, activities is that they, they realize that there's, really, they, that there's nothing really different from, um, from one school of thought to another. Um, that they have um, their their common word it will always be love for God, and from that they start to understand each other and move outward to the community. Mm. So I think intra dialogue. Yeah, you should always start, start inside. in yourself and then within the community and then go outside so that they would know how Muslims are really in in, in the real context of the word. Mm -hmm. so, so I, I think the, the problem, the inside-outside problem, is equally problematic. I think, they're, in my point of view, they're linked to the same issue. Um, from the outside, you know, it's, it's the story of what you think a Muslim is or what they're supposed to be, and then kind of trying to keep people in that box and not being able to see them outside of, of this preconceived notion. But I think from the inside, a lot of it, at least in the past 10 years, has been so reactionary to that perception. Um, well, I grew up in a mosque of, I grew, I, you know, I grew up with two mosques. One was uh, an Iraqi American mosque, uh, and I come from a Sunni and Shia family, which to Iraqis, that's something you don't talk about. Like that's, you know, although it's very popular in the news, like you never ask each other these questions, it's irrelevant. But my point is, I grew up with two sides already to see one thing, and in that mosque, the people would sit, men and women, you know, women on this side, men on that side, against the wall, around the wall, like as a community. And if somebody had something to say, they would. It didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. If, if the speaker needed to be corrected because they slipped in, in what they were quoting, a woman would feel free to correct him. I think. You know, the what I grew up with and, and the other mosque that I attended is a mosque that, you know, people, and to this day, women don't walk in with wearing hijab. They, they put on hijab when it's time to pray. Um, and, you know, communities gather there and, and it's just, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's normal, so to speak. But that's not how we perceive each other as Muslims when we talk about ourselves. You know, and I think that that is the same as the way non-Muslims don't perceive us like that when they talk about us. You know, if you want to do the us and them thing, it's all it's all this this concept. It, you know, it's become a very one-dimensional way of seeing Muslims. That inside we're not allowing ourselves freedom of diversity, and outside we're not being given the freedom of diversity. Well, I'm. I've been working with women um, who came to Denmark, and we have a very tight uh, law, foreigners' law, immigration laws, and 
when it comes to permanent uh, you know, state permits. And uh, I've been working with women who came to Denmark, married Danish men. That means also of a different ethnic origin, but with a Dan uh, Danish passport. And what was common for the women was that, that I spoke with was that they were violated. And I wanted to let them speak, have them a, give them a voice. So I collaborated with an artist, and we did uh, interviews and photographs anonymously. And what we wanted to do was addressing both outwards and inwards, because you can do that by displaying the truth and letting the voices be heard. So when the women told about their stories and the way they were violated, they were telling about the men who violated them, but they were at the same time telling about the law that didn't give them the right to get out of that marriage. Uh, because the law was like, you have to stay seven years with the same husband on the same address, otherwise you're not given an independent state permit. That's Danish law. That's the Danish law. So I think sometimes you need to just think about what's the truth and let the voices out and then see what happens. It hits both sides. Of course, it's not easy. It's not, it's, there are many shades to this question, I think. I'd just I like to add on mm -hmm. that. On the Philippines, we have, uh, we have a special law for Muslims, um, the Philippine Muslim Personal Law. So um, one of our advocacies in our group is that um, to support the amendment of some entries um, in that law, um, especially regarding divorce, inheritance, and marriages. Um, so we're trying to do away with the early, the, the marriages of, early, of young women, of young children, as, as, long as, uh, as early as 14 years old. So we're trying to avoid that and the equal distribution of inheritance uh, among the children, uh, either she's a male, she's a female, or, or, or a male, so. And the divorce, especially the divorce thing, because um, it's really very uh, unfair for women, for Muslim women, um, when it comes to the, the divorce law in the Philippines, um, especially the Muslim laws in the Philippines, because uh, I'm not sure if it's um, common to all countries, um, especially the Muslim laws in all countries, but. Um, it, is a, it, it is important that uh, women that should be protected from their husbands who would just want to just divorce them without any reason and that, um, they don't have any say on that. So we're trying to amend some personal laws uh, in our constitution about that. Mm -hmm. um, three of you are from uh, our Muslim minorities where you are. One of you, <laughs> Dahlia from uh, the Emirates, you live in what's still called a Muslim country, but you say the majority now are not, they're expats. Mm -hmm. So what, if you can just give us a little bit of insight as to what that, what that means to be kind of, the United Arab Emirates is a Muslim country, but then there's this huge expat population, but then if someone wants to practice like you. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting uh, society. I've been in Dubai for eight years, and um, uh, it's just, uh, there's, it's one of the most, uh, I'm from Canada, and I would say it's more diverse than it is in Canada, or the US, actually, um, in, in terms of the nationalities that used to have come together there. And there's just a basis of respect. Um, and I, it's, it's, it's really interesting how it's, it's achieved, but um, for a woman to live there, it's actually, very, very easy place to live as a Muslim woman. Um, partly because all of the malls have prayer rooms and uh, there are mosques all around. But also because um, there's so much freedom to just be yourself. Um, if you go to, uh, it's a very uh, you know, classy sort of posh city. And if you go to Dubai Mall, which is the world's biggest mall, of course, um, you'll, you'll see um, a lot of uh, women wearing niqab, for instance, uh, which is the, showing only their eyes. And, they're wearing the traditional um, abaya, which a lot of the Emirati women wear. Um, and um, I think that you know, there's always these debates about niqab in places like France. And, and, and if you see a woman in the street in, in Canada or in the US, you, you, even if they, they're made to feel a bit uncomfortable. Whereas in, in Dubai Mall, if you go to Dubai Mall, you'll see a woman with her children walking in niqab. Uh, and then two seconds later, a woman wearing a mini skirt 
which I was saying you couldn't wear here because it's too cold. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and, and they feel free to do that. And women wearing, you know, traditional, their traditional um, Pakistani uh, uh, attire or Indian attire or Bangladeshi attire. And, and you see different forms of, for instance, head covering with like Western clothing or, and it just becomes um, completely irrelevant what you're wearing. And I, that's what I love about it because suddenly the, the focus is more on the spirit of the faith. And, and I love that because um, it just makes it, makes it a lot easier to exist and to coexist um, when there's this mutual respect. Uh, that, so, so that's one of the things, that, the qualities that's very unique uh, to Dubai, actually, um, that they've been able to achieve that. Uh, and I think that a lot of women you know, um, feel quite comfortable living there for that reason. Lots of questions coming in. Everybody has questions. So I think we should just start with the audience questions at this point. All right. You know the terrorism question was, was coming. <laughs> Two people ask, are asking that question. So this one says, how do terrorist acts in the name of Islam affect you personally as a Muslim? You know it was coming. <laughs> As a Muslim woman, has your art or your work or your identity been affected by the negative stereotypes of Muslims that these terrorist acts perpetuate? Uh, we knew this question was coming. <laughs> yeah. So you were ready for it, so go for it. I, did, I, I left hope in my heart but it wasn't going to be. Um, how does it affect me? Well, how much time do you have? Um, it affects me every day because, you know, that is what people perceive Islam as. And I think it's very normal in the United States to talk about Muslims, to specifically talk about Islam at the whole religion as, you know, um, something that promotes terrorism and violence. So. You know, then as a Muslim, that's that's part of how I'm perceived, and then um, I, I mean, there's there's that side of things. I think the real side, like my side, how does it affect me? It's, I mean, simply put, it really sucks that people <laughs> associate their terrorism with Islam. It really sucks because then it just, you know puts us all in this thing and it has nothing to do with the Islam that everybody I know knows about, you know what I mean? So I don't relate to it, it has nothing to do with my life, there's that part, you know. Um, I think it affects me more as, say like the Boston bombings affects me more as an American. And then there's the other side of them being a Muslim American where it's like, Oh no. <laughs> Are they, is it going to be Muslims? It, oh no. And then you're bracing because of the backlash that we've seen over and over and over again, even when it's not Muslims. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, in many ways and then in no way at all, if that makes sense. Yeah? Well, um, in the Philippines, um, we have this we have this conflict a um, long, long time ago, between, uh, before 9-11 happened and everything here in America. Um, we have this, uh, we have this uh, rebellion before against the national government, um, the Muslim rebellion. Um, it, was a, it was really a rebellion to establish a national identity um, uh, and, and the right to self-determination. So along the way, um, we have um, both sides, the, the government, the, the, the Muslims at the Moro, uh, we, call, we call that Moro, Moro rebellion on that, during that time. So both sides have developed these uh, prejudices against each other and things like that. And today, um, like I was just telling them, um, I think last year, there was this uh, feature in the National Dailies, um, it was headlined. Um, there, the, there was. Uh, it was a picture of our president, President Aquino, and receiving a woman uh, wearing a niqab, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the niqab, yeah. And the caption read, "Security threat." So that was really hurtful. But what what was um, uh, what was very important was that not all the Muslims reacted because uh, with the advent of the social media, the Facebook and the Twitter and everything. 
um, there was a negative, uh, there was a backlash against the National Day look, look, uh, saying that, uh, putting that caption. Um, so uh, I think midday, uh, because the day, the day goes out early in the morning, so I think midday, uh, they reprinted the entire page and changed that caption. Uh, unfortunately, that, that woman was my aunt. Uh, and she was she was there uh, meeting the president because her son uh, was appointed the regional speaker of our uh, region, uh, the autonomous region in Maslimintana. So she was there as part of her son's pride. So she was wearing that, and then the media captioned that secretly prep. So it, it's really it it's really hurtful. But uh, and in some place, especially in, I, I'm living in Davao City now. It's it's a predominantly a non-Muslim community. Um, we have subdivisions, not only in Davao, but I think in the entire Philippines. Um, we have subdivisions who would refuse Muslims to buy houses or properties in their subdivisions. So this, 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 there are discriminations happening because of the negative stereotype, the negative perception brought about by media, by what ha what's happening. Um, around the world um, that is perceived to be and, uh, in the name of Islam and everything. So it's, it's really difficult. Um, but we have, what, what we've been doing in our work is that we have to be always proactive in counter, uh, counter, countering that negative perception. Mm -hmm. Well, it creates a lot of feelings when you ask this. And uh, I'll try to answer it in three ways. I can't do it one. <laughs> one is, uh, I'm thinking, I'm not going to apologize. That's one thing. The other is, it's it's like shit. It, when it hits you, you don't like it because it stinks. <laughs> third is that, yeah, well, it's right. You don't want it. And the third is that I was in, uh, well, I'm in Denmark, and there was this uh, incident in Sweden where there were these, uh, this one man uh, going on with his killings. And I was in Odense, uh, where my mother lives and my brother. And I was in sitting with them, and we were watching this with our kids around us. And the media immediately, without knowing who he was, said that it must be uh, an incident that was carried out by Muslims. Um, and you know what, my mother, she's a very active woman. She's been fighting all her life for communities and she's been given a prize and everything. She's a very tough woman. And my brother, he's a journalist, so we all engage in dialogue, outwards and inwards. And we were sitting there crying. So, yeah. I think, I, I mean, I agree with everything that was said. And, I think and we talked about this yesterday, Dahlia. You said, you know, yeah, why do I even have to talk yeah, about it? I think the only thing I would say is, um, you know, Islam and the Quran, it says that if you kill one person, you're killing all of humanity. If you save one life, you're saving all of humanity. And that's the fundamental. I mean, that's what most of us live by. And so I can't identify with acts of terrorism, and I think most of us can't. And so it's really difficult to actually answer that question. Um, and this is uh, Sophia. She is one of the Muslim ambassadors as well. Um, uh, let me give you the mic. Hold on. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Samina and Catherine, for this opportunity. Uh, what I'd like to say, uh, answer this question is that um, in a very short sentence, uh, when something like this happens, like Boston 9 11, um, I feel that. A lot of Muslims, there are a lot of Muslims in this country and they're doing such a great job. My husband is a physician, saving lives. Um, but when something like this happens, I feel like I, 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 I drown. Somebody pulls me down underwater and then I come back up again after a few days and I breathe and some idiot does something again and somebody pulls me down again and it feels bad. It feels really bad. I think many of us can, can, can relate to that. Uh, okay. Yes, Miranda. Uh, I was Katie, Miranda. Come on up. 
also one of the Muslim ambassadors. Um, I, I don't remember the question exactly, but uh, could you repeat it again? It was how how do acts of terrorism um, affect you, or how do you how do you perceive them? Do they affect you as a Muslim woman? What do you think? I think we need to ask ourselves as Americans: How do the acts of terrorism committed by our government in Pakistan, in Palestine, via the Israeli government, in Yemen? in Somalia, in Iraq, etc. How do those affect our identity as Americans? I think that's a much bigger question. Thank you. All right, Katie. Thank you very much. Are we really in the last question? Uh, I'm so sorry. There are so many questions, which is, is really encouraging. Um, but we have to end this right now. Um, so I'm going to ask the final question. If there was one thing you would want the public to know about you, what is it? <laughs> Just one. No crying. Just one. I have a speech, right? OK, I want people to know that I'm a good person, and I'm a Muslim. So I'm not different from the others, but I'm a good person. So I want you to see that. Not by religion, not Islam as a, as a violent religion, or because Islam per se is a religion of peace. So you have to look beyond what the other people are doing and claiming that they're doing that in the name of Islam. Because there are other, the half of, I, I'm not sure if it's half, I think three fourths or whatever. There are other Muslims who are doing things for, for the world, for the betterment of the world. So do not lump us, including you all. Yeah. So do not lump us with those people who commit these crimes because we are not them. We are different from them because I, I, I myself do not call them as Muslims because if you are a Muslim, you do not do that. You do not take lives or hurt people. So that's that's what I want you to know. Everybody to know that I that we are good. I am a good person and I am a Muslim. Bye, Lali. Thank you. Very profound. Powerful. Uzma, your turn. I'm not always good. <laughs> I'm, I'm bad too. <laughs> and I want to be able to. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, that I'm a human being, I'm a woman, I'm a mother. That's all, and I insist on um, having focus on coexistence and democracy and the right to define myself and the right for others to define themselves. And that's my focus, and I, I, I stick on to that, although I think it's difficult at times. Okay, Dahlia, you're looking right at me. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, it's really hard to say one thing, but I, I guess. Um, you know, I, I just want people to know that, that Islam, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a very modern professional woman, and Islam is, is the heart of my life. And it, is, it brings me the most peace of mind, and it's a beautiful state of existence. Um, the piece that I wrote for the exhibition was um, actually inspired by um, the very first Muslim. And the very first Muslim was the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. She was uh, 15 years older than him, a very powerful businesswoman. He worked for her, and she proposed marriage to him. <laughs> and actually, you know, I think a lot of people miss, uh, miss that story. Um, and, and for me, as a Muslim woman, she inspi has inspired me so much in my own life and in my profession and, in my, and how I deal with my community and with my family and with um, my colleagues. And uh, so I would just, you know, encourage people to, you know, to just read a little bit more about Muslim women because we have everything that we need and we're very empowered. So, so one thing, if there was one thing, <laughs> one thing you would like the public to, to know about you once and for all. Once and for all. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> I think, I don't know. I, I, I would just, one thing before I tell you. Um, in thinking about what's being said, it's making me think of that, you know, that question about terrorism. I think where I really see it resonate is with the youth. And I think that that's an important part that we need to really think about. Young people are growing up with these, you know, this really um, sense, a sense of isolation. And I don't think that's productive internally, you know, for the Muslim communities. And I don't think that's productive in general society. Um, because Muslims are everywhere. They are a sixth or more of the world population. We are all around. <laughs> we, we, we're a big part of this world. And, I think we neither can afford internally to isolate ourselves, nor should the, the rest of the world population feel a need to isolate us. I think young people are exactly where to start. They don't want any of that crap. You know, They, they want to just be able to be who they are. Um, so I think that's the biggest effect in terms of when you talk about stereotypes and things like that. Um, one thing I'll tell you about myself that I think you probably already know is that I like to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that wraps up this Q&A. And I just want to say you can see all of their art uh, and writings uh, in the Muslima exhibit, imow.muslima.org, as well as the rest of the ambassadors. Um, and we'd also like to encourage you to uh, join the pledge, the Speak Up, Listen Up campaign, which is an important part of this exhibition. We're asking visitors to sign a pledge to show your commitment to putting an end to negative attitudes about Muslim women and to instead show your support uh, to the efforts being made by Muslim women worldwide, like these lovely ladies are, for a more just, equitable and inclusive world. So if you haven't already done this, please make that pledge today. And you can go online upstairs. You can go upstairs and make this pledge. You can go online. And please spread the word about the exhibit to everybody you know. Thank you. all of you so much. Um, I know that all of us have been truly moved and inspired by the words that we've heard this afternoon and particularly what um, people have courageously shared with us. The unifying theme of what we've heard this afternoon has really been about courage and strength and resilience. Whether that's the courage to find and share your voice, even when you're telling a story that the mainstream media doesn't want to hear, or whether it's the courage to define yourself in your own terms. The courage actually of the funders who stepped up to support this exhibition when so many people said it was a controversial, even a dangerous project. And the courage of all of you who are here this afternoon in being ready to propel the dialogue and to reach across boundaries and borders in a world where unfortunately that's still all too rare.